we are in good spirits that um, the gentleman sitting next to me will actually help us in whoa help us trying to figure out where that noise is coming from and um, because he knows a little bit about noise and stuff and um, so therefore I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. Dave Smith. So early on um, Mr. Tomita um, was asked whether he ever met Wendy Walter Carlos, Walter Wendy Carlos and um, I was wondering, can you actually remember when that album came out? And Switch on Bach or, yeah. or Snowflakes? Or which? Switch on Bach. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, one of the things that initially got me interested mm. in electronic music and synthesizers. In which shape or form? Uh, just, uh, uh, it was just interesting to hear something electronic mm. sound so... Um, it was just so lifelike. I mean, the way she played it was just, uh, it sounded like a, an acoustic instrument. I mean, we've all know about, you know, what what's electronic and what's not. And it just had this life into it that was just amazing to hear from the way she played it. Was that a record you could actually hear on the radio? Or how do you get, did you get in contact uh, with it? I don't know. I bought the album, uh, but I... No, I, don't, I doubt it was played on the radio. No, probably not. I don't remember. You never know. I mean, it was the 60s and all. That's right. And it was the uh, best-selling classical album of all time. It might still be. I don't know if that record's ever been broken. But uh, that's pretty amazing for uh, a synthesizer to beat all those big orchestras. <laughs> you might be biased in that sort of... Might be. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, where were you at the time? Uh, what year did it come out? Was it late 60s? I don't know. So. I don't remember. I was probably still in college. I don't even remember what year it came out. Does anybody know what year? Do tell. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Uh, but I was probably still in college. Yeah. And what were you doing in college? I was uh, at UC Berkeley and taking, I was in electrical engineering and computer science and playing in bands once in a while on the side, playing guitar and bass guitar. And this Berkeley in the 60s, was it anything close to what we imagined it to be? Uh, somewhat, yeah, on a, yeah, regularly. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, crazy in which form? Oh, uh, you know, tax squads coming down the streets and tear gas and whatever. It was, yeah, it got silly at times, but it was... Uh, also a pretty uh, interesting period to live through. Were you a protester? Uh, I was more of a protester observer. <coughs> you know, as a, I, I would watch but not get actively involved. I mean, when you think about or when you talk about all the music and the electronics of the time, it's kind of interesting how close it actually is and the overlap to actual current affairs. Like... Um, when um, your friend Tom Oberheim um, lived in the same building as the guys who um, found the Watergate documents, for mm. example, and all these yeah. bizarre little overlaps where you just <laughs> think like, hey, a Hollywood script writer wouldn't have thought of that. It's like... Um, well, again, it was crazy times, but when you're going through it, you know, you, you don't recognize it necessarily as such. What way are you studying over there? Uh, electrical engineering, computer science. Mm -hmm. And what did that look like? Because, I mean, uh, it was mildly different as well. Y yeah, it, everybody's probably tired of hearing about what it used to be like when I was young. Uh, but the computers were huge. You wrote programs on punched cards, and you had to turn them into the computer center and wait a few hours to get it back to see if it compiled or not. And it was a slow process. But uh, one thing I did do, uh, and this was probably in 1971, uh, while I was still there is I wrote a program that composed music and uh, the only way I can get the, it out was to have it printed on a plotter so it would draw, draw five lines and then draw a circle and then put an asterisk in the middle if it was a quarter note and it was pretty rudimentary uh, but um, it was way back <laughs> Think um, things were basic and what were the machines that were processing all this uh, they were 
room size computers that would do it. Uh, Control Data was one of the computers. I don't. I think they've been long gone. Uh, but yeah, I remember my dad had a computer book at the time, or a little later actually, and um, there was this photo in there, and someone was extremely proud and had a tic tac toe drawn onto a screen, and it's like one day these machines will be able to play tic-tac-toe against you. <laughs> yeah, I remember my uh, senior year, uh, one of my professors uh, predicted that one day that the power of one of these computers would only cost $1,000. And of course, everybody said, no, no way, it couldn't be. And of course, these things were a fraction, the power of an iPhone these days. Uh, and just, you know, orders of magnitude different. Do you still care about magnitude and, you know, all those laws about how data storage and processing powers go up and what they actually do to you? Or Well, you just take advantage of whatever technology is available when you're designing a new product. Uh, I, you know, I don't usually think about the details of that, but you just say, I need this kind of a part and this kind of memory. Uh, the basics are all the same as they were back then. You have a processor, you have memory, you have input and output. And that's what makes a computer. Uh, and of course, all these instruments have at least one or many computers in them to do the same thing. In your opinion, how much of that do you actually need to know if you want to use something like that efficiently? Uh, hopefully zero if we do our job right. Uh, it should have nothing to do with computers. It should only be about making music. And um, is that the way you approached it when you first started implementing circuitry? in order to generate music? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I started making instruments for my own use. Uh, my first product was actually an analog sequencer. Um, I had bought a Mini Moog in 1972 just to play around with and then decided to build things to go with it. And once I built those, I decided to try to sell them. Uh, so it was always from a user's point of view and not from an engineer's point of view. How much was that mini MOOC back then? Uh, $1,500. Which is about the money of a car at the time, right? Yes. A pretty good car, actually. Uh, not a good car, but a car. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty good. Not that good. You could buy a new car for that amount of money. Yeah. So where did you get that from? You were out of university by that time, right? Yes, I was working in aer the aerospace industry. This was a time when uh, nobody wanted to hire engineers. It was... Uh, I was in what was to become Silicon Valley, but it was not quite Silicon Valley yet. Uh, so it was very early on in the uh, technical revolution, I suppose you might say. Uh, so I worked uh, at Lockheed uh, doing stupid work because uh, that's the only place I can get a job. And a friend told me uh, he saw this <coughs> um, synthesizer thing in a music store. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So I went to look at it, and it uh, was a mini Moog. And I had no idea what it did or how it worked. It just looked cool, and it was kind of a perfect combination of my music background and technical background. So the next day, I went to the Lockheed Credit Union and got a loan and went back and bought it. And here I am. I mean, it, it kind of looked... So, <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that's another thing we might need to thank the military-industrial complex for. Then. <laughs> Very indirectly. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the machinery kind of looked similar to what you would have found in an actual Lockheed product, right? I mean, you... Mm, uh, I don't know, maybe. I, I, I suppose if you get back to basics, you can yeah. make that parallel. Yeah. And um, so you bought that Mini Moog, and then you probably had a very similar experience to what Mr. Tomita earlier on um, described, even though, I mean him dealing with the modulus that was still a little bit more painful but anyone ever bought something from that era in this room anyone ever tried something from that era in this room so so um, well the original mini mogs yeah yeah so so i guess you the first moment is kind of similar to everyone of going like uh yeah but how do i actually make it sound good and how did you master that? Uh, well, it was, it was trial and error. Uh, you know, you couldn't just hop in the internet and find out how something worked. So you had to play around with it. Uh, I 
doubt there were any books. Uh, I don't think there was even a manual that came with the Mini Moog. It was just kind of there, and you slowly figure out how it works. And some people never figured it out, and they just, uh, you know, it's a famous story I heard way back when about uh, a friend, English friend of mine, who worked, uh, went into the studio um, with uh, Pink Floyd's studio, and he saw all these Mini Moogs that were covered in uh, uh, duct tape. And so he asked him, well, wh why are all these instruments covered with tape? And apparently when somebody would find a sound that they liked, they'd have the roadie come out and tape all the knobs where they were so that they'd always have that sound. <laughs> so that, that's early programmability, I guess. And um, how would you t then take that to the live environment? Does that mean if the band decides to play an encore, you'd need a roadie to, to wheel in the next one? or like? I doubt they did that live. But uh, yeah, to use uh, Mini Moog Live, you pretty much had to know what you were doing, unless you just used the same sound and turned a cut off up and down. Right. Um, how much of what you saw on that machine did actually relate to stuff that you were um, learning at school? Like, did you know already about waveforms and stuff? Or uh, Virtually nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was taking a lot of computer classes, um, and I took some basic electronics classes, but it had absolutely nothing to do with any of this. So I had to learn about oscillators and filters and so forth. Um, so was it a deliberate decision to start when you built your first own um, unit to go with the sequencer or um... uh, that was again mostly something I just wanted to play with I had read books or I, I don't even know how I found out about it but Moog made these big sequencers mm. uh, does everybody know what an analog sequencer is like I assume uh, just um, rows of knobs and you just send control voltages out to a synthesizer to uh, control pitch or filters or whatever um, and um, but that's probably the first hurdle where you lose a lot of people. What okay. are those control voltages? Okay. Uh, well, it depends how far back do we want to go here with a, with a how how many synth experts do we have here? Ooh. Okay, we have to work in this. Uh, how many people kind of know their way around a synth? Okay, that's better. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, I don't want to get too far into. I mean, the thing is just mumble jumbo because yeah, mumble jumbo is actually kind of good because there's a good chance that a lot of people have been sleeping through their physics classes, and um, <laughs> at one stage you start to figure out like, oh, hang on, some of that actually does help. So if you could give us the Cliff Notes version of that, I think a lot of people might be really helpful for that. Okay, well, I actually it's kind of relevant now. Uh, I like to say that basic subtractive synthesis which is what analog synthesizers are, have pretty much passed the test of time now. They've been around for a good 50 years. They, they're still used every day. They're used in analog form. They're used in digital form. Uh, you know, access virus, the Nord stuff, uh, software synthesis. A lot of, most of them just implement subtractive synthesis. And since there's been a revival of analog lately, uh, the real thing is back. But basically you start with uh, oscillators, that are harmonically rich, uh, and you have different shapes for different tone colors. And then you pass it through a filter, and everybody knows what a filter does. It takes stuff out. Um, and that's pretty much the basic uh, concept. So you start out with a lot of sound, and you filter it down to what you uh, want, and you use uh, envelopes, which basically just control the shape of it to uh, change the sound. Uh, and it's for whatever reason, it happens to be a synthesis method that's really easy to understand and to relate with. I mean, I'm sure most of you know what happens when you turn a cutoff knob on the filter. You, it's a sound that everybody's heard, everybody can relate to, on, and on any synthesizer, you know what that knob's going to do. So it's, it's really kind of a classic sound now, and I, th I think it's going to be around for a long time because of that. You compare it to FM synthesis, where nobody can figure out how to program it. I, I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, it's, there's just something about subtractive synthesis that's very accessible. Is there something like um, the perfect patch kind of thing that you could probably... We have this nifty setup here that where we could use one of your machines that we will get to in a little bit to probably demonstrate what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, the, the nice thing about the 
profit is it's five is it's very simple uh, where every knob, every control is on the front panel. It's not like most instruments now where you have to go through different pages and there's too many features and so forth to get to. So I could actually just make the whole front panel live and let's just go with a real simple sound. Okay, that's about as simple as it gets, just a single sawtooth. Um, well. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I was, because I saw something earlier with the camera, so I was under the impression that we can have that signal on there. My bad. <laughs> okay. So, you want to hold the note? Oh, yeah. No, hold the, hold the note, and I can... Okay, so now, now it goes to the cutoff, and... Everybody knows what that sounds like. It's, it usually has a little bit of uh, resonance on it, so it's... So that's the most basic sound you can have on an analog synth. Uh, of course, you could add a second oscillator. Beef it up a little, and he, and from there on, it's mostly a matter of how you modulate things, i.e., how you change the sound in real time. Uh, you could add an LFO to a change. What is that LFO thing? Okay, the LFO thing. Oh, we're really getting down to a basic class here. Okay, you're gonna learn ten years worth of synthesis class in five minutes. Um, so most os the main oscillators, the sawtooth that we're listening to is at audio frequencies, so you hear it as a pitch. Uh, if you have a really low frequency oscillator, with, uh, it's not, you don't hear it as at a pitch because it might be changing once or twice a second, but it's the same basic shape. So if I have a low frequency oscillator, uh, So you can hear it changing the frequency of the, it's modulating the pitch of the main oscillator. And this is hard to do without a blackboard <laughs> and uh, describing what's going on otherwise. But this is using a low frequency oscillator to change the frequency of the main audio oscillator. So can, we try hand, can we try hand waves instead of a blackboard? Hand waves? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, So that's what a low frequency oscillator is used for. Usually you use it for vibrato. Uh, you know, most pitch wheel or modulation wheels are hooked up that way in most sense. Uh, an easy way to get some, some sort of articulation and sound control while you're playing live. How much of that when you first started thinking about these processes, were you just following what other people did? Or um, were you, I mean... We're thinking like, oh, you know what? Today I'm going to introduce this waveform in here because I like it. Or is there, was there a certain set that you figured, oh, my machine needs to have this? Are we talking specifically on the design of this product? Or yeah. um, it's a little of both. If uh, you're familiar with the Mini Moog and you look at the front panel of the Prophet Five, you can see a lot of similarities, and that's because I kind of got started on a Mini Moog. Back then, the Mini Moog and the Art Odyssey were the two big instruments uh, of the day. And since I got a Mini Moog, this looks more like a Mini Moog, whereas if I had gotten an Art Odyssey, maybe it would have looked more like an Art Odyssey. Uh, but some of the basics, you always have a sawtooth wave. You always have a pulse wave. Uh, you often have a triangle wave. Uh, you always have a low-pass filter. Uh, so some of these things are just givens. Uh, Beyond that, there's a lot of things that are different in the Prophet 5 because it's the first uh, polyphonic synthesizer. Now, what is this monophonic, polyphonic thing? <laughs> Buzzwords. Um, the funny thing was when the Mini Moog first came out, since it had a keyboard on it, uh, a lot of people would go up to it, and the first thing they'd do is play a chord, and only one note would play, and they'd go, what's going on? Is this broken? Uh, and because the concept of, you know, the only thing people would see keyboards on would be pianos and organs, and so you could play a chord. Uh, and the argument was that it's like going up and saying, well, I've got a trumpet and I can only play one note on it. But with wheels and the different controls you have on a Mini Moog, you can actually articulate so much more on a single note 
because it's monophonic. Monophonic just means one note. You can only play one note at a time. So there was a lot of benefits, and that's why the original use of a mini Moog was usually to play lead lines, uh, soloing, or uh, bass lines often, too. Um, so, but a lot of people did want to be able to play more than one note at a time. So if you play, can play a bunch of notes, then it's called polyphonic, so more voices. Uh, multiple voices. So the Prophet 5 was actually the first polyphonic programmable synthesizer to come out. I mean, the late Dr. Bob Moog that um, you quoted earlier as some sort of a role model, uh, in a way, as at least through the product, he said that um, if God would have wanted us to have more than one voice, he would have given us that. And so, you know, if, if you want to hear more than one, you need to form a choir. And... I mean, it's good for business. You need to sell more sense that way. But um, yeah, if, if you are into playing a chord now and then, then yes, it might help if you... Definitely. That yes, and, and that's what everybody really always wanted. Uh, you know, even now, there are a lot of monophonic synths out again. And people, you know, there's a lot you can do with it and they're fun to play with. But, you know, 90% of the actual playing is on polyphonic units. Um even though at the same time there were a lot of people that were trying to push the boundaries further and said like, oh no, the keyboard is limiting us actually. And um, why do we create this new instrument and then start thinking in these old terms again? And I mean, some of them were pretty close to you, right? Well, there, that's always been an argument. Uh, in fact, if you look back in uh, synthesizer history, uh, the original synthesizers were actually invented by two people at the same time. Uh, Bob Moog on the East Coast and Don Buchla on the West Coast, and he was actually in Berkeley. Uh, and the main reason that Bob Moog uh, <coughs> is more well known is because he put a keyboard on his synthesizers and Don Buchla didn't. He had more uh, different types of controllers just for that reason, because he wanted, he didn't want to limit it to what he called black and whites, where everything's on, off, on, off, play this note and it has to be this note, it can't be in between. Uh, but Don Buchla also was the first, he invented the sequencer. He invented a lot of things on synthesizers. And I, I think Bob Moog even said once that uh, Don may have built a modular synth before he did. Uh, but most people just don't realize that. And I mean, Moog was a really marketable name as well. I mean, it well, it's a nice name, well. but it, yeah. it took, uh, when the Mini Moog came out, that was kind of it. It had a keyboard, it was portable, it was reasonable cost and fairly available. Uh, I mean, it didn't, they weren't everywhere. I mean, people think that there are millions of Mini Moogs, but I think there were only like 12 or 13,000 built, which is, you know, in the world of musical instruments, is not a huge number. It's still a lot more than the Moog modulars. Well, like, I mean, definitely. Or like a Buchla system. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, how, did you get any educated guess of like how many of those units were sold? I have no idea. But I mean, definitely less than four digits, I guess. Uh, yeah, I would think. When did you actually hear about those people, you know, that, that it's not just a machine, but that there's actual people behind them building them? Uh, well, you you would hear about them, but I, you know, I probably didn't meet Bob until the late '70s, uh, and probably a little later than I met Don Buchla. Um, so, uh, Alan Perlman, another person, he founded ARP. Uh, it's Alan R. Perlman was his name, so that's where ARP came from. Uh, so, yeah, they were all the guys running the company, and of course, Tom Oberheim and Roger Lynn and. Uh, the rest of the graying. Um, did you consider them in any shape, form as uh, competitors, or like in all shapes and forms? <laughs> did you have boxing bouts? <laughs> no, um, actually, it was my cut, it was better than we were all friends, and we you know always get together at trade shows, and uh, uh, there was no animosity, and we were all kind of in the same place, having fun doing what we were doing because it was all back then. It was course easier to innovate because none of this had been done before so every year it'd be fun to see what people would come up with because uh, it was it was all new so yeah we we everybody knew everybody and we all got along i mean trade shows were mildly different then i mean nam was at the basement of a hotel right uh when we showed the prophet five in 1978 at the january nam show how many people have here been to a nam show just 
how many people know what an AM show is? Okay. Uh, it's just the biggest trade show for musical instruments in the world. Uh, and this is actually a funny story, because uh, when we first showed it, it was in the basement of the Disneyland Hotel. That's how big the January NAMM show was. Uh, back then, they had a summer NAMM show in Chicago that was huge. And that's because the instrument market was pianos and organs and brass instruments and band instruments. And most of those companies were based in, uh, in the Midwest. So that was a huge show. And, there was, and then they just kind of started this tiny offshoot in Los Angeles, in Anaheim. Uh, but then over the next few years, as technology took over, it became more of a West Coast industry. And the um, January show just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the summer show went away. And it disappeared for a few years. And they recently brought it back and have a small show in Nashville in the summer. And it's more of a guitar-oriented uh, show, which makes sense. Uh, but it's, it's been real interesting to see how the whole music industry kind of moved west as the technology took over. Yeah, I was curious about that. You said earlier on you were in the valley when there was not that much silicon around. And um, did you profit in any way from those companies um, clustering up up there? Uh, well, sure, yeah. There's, everything was there. Intel was there. I mean, all the high-tech companies were very close by, so that, that was definitely a help. So when you went out and said, like, okay, I really love this machine, I want to do my own, I guess you would obviously not go on the internet and go, like, oh, I want to have the Curtis chips or I want to have this thing. It's like, um, how do you actually go about that? You certainly didn't get the silicon yourself and mold it and etch it. And well, there were two, two parts that... Uh led to the development of the Prophet 5. Uh, one was I already had a background in microprocessors, so I knew how they worked. And my day job, I was using microprocessors. So it was a real obvious thing to me to use a microprocessor to make a programmable polyphonic synth. The other thing is we uh, knew the e people from EMU Systems, who uh, probably most of you know, and uh, they were just across town. And I had heard that they were involved with developing a new chipset where they had an oscillator integrated circuit, they had a filter circuit, and they had an envelope and a VCA. And so I said, oh, well, it's obvious. You can take those parts, put them together with a microprocessor, and build a polyphonic programmable synth. So th those two, knowing about those two things were what led to this. Uh, at first, I didn't even start designing this because I figured it was such an obvious idea that Moog and ARP would already be doing it. But after waiting a few months, I figured, well, maybe they're not doing it because I hadn't heard anything. So then I decided to just sort of jump in and do it. Which is a pretty crucial step. And I guess that's um, kind of goes in the same way for people who are trying to decide whether they want to pursue a career in music or starting your own business. It's like, uh, wow, do I really put all my all behind this or like? You got to take risks at some point. I mean, again, I started sequential circuits as something I did at night on weekends. I had a regular day job working as an engineer, and I just waited to a point where I kind of hit my critical mass, and that's when I just kind of jumped in, quit the job, and said, here, here we go. And um, how big did that company actually grow to? Sequential circuits? Yeah. Uh, at its peak, we had 180 people, maybe. Something like that. Which is a lot and also a lot to administer. Yeah, it was a headache. <laughs> so did you actually get people to help you with that side of it? Or were you just like, oh, I yeah, have someone else do all this stuff? I just uh, want to do. It was a little of all. It, I, it, it was hard. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just a kid and just kind of worked my way into this thing. And it got kind of out of control. And uh, we had a great time most of the time doing what we were doing, but it was also very difficult. And the competition, you know, would keep getting ratcheted up every year. Fortunately, we had a couple years when this first came out before we had much competition. Uh, but then after that, once the 80s started, you know, it just got more and more crowded. Um, before it all got crowded, if you look back at it now, I guess you're kind of doing it with that new company you're doing, but what would you have done differently then at that age as well? Yeah. Uh, circumstances are so different now that it's really kind of an unfair 
comparison. Um, I, yeah, this company now, my Dave Smith Instruments is just completely different. It's, we're a tiny company, there's only 10 of us. Uh, and think tools, design tools are so much uh, more efficient now. You can just do so much more. I, there's really only uh, myself and I, one other software guy and one other hardware guy, and the three of us pretty much design all of our products. Uh, and we can do it faster and quicker than big companies because we are small. And we don't have a marketing department. We don't have a sales department. We don't have people telling us what to do. We just do whatever we want to do, which makes it much more efficient. Um, um, but we couldn't have done it that way back then. It just yeah, Obviously, because, uh, I mean, now you can easily source out, let's say, the motherboards or etching and customizing chips and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, Whereas one of the main reasons we had so many people back then is because we, ha we built the units ourselves uh, in Silicon Valley, so we had to have a real factory. Uh, this time around, uh, we contract out the manufacturing, though they're just built across town. All of our instruments are still built in San Francisco, and we just export from there. So we have the advantages of having local production and not built in China and all that. Uh, but we don't have the headaches of a factory. Big difference. Speaking of factories um, and the market getting crowded at some stage, can you, and Japan entered that game as well, can you remember your first um, visit here? Uh, I don't remember my first visit. I've been here probably 25 times uh, over those, mostly over those years back then. I This is my first visit in 20 years uh, for whatever reason. I'm not sure why there was a big gap. So it's been kind of fun to come back and see all the changes and uh, all that. But uh, I don't remember which trip was my very first one. It was probably around 1979, maybe. And what was your reason for going then? Uh, visit a uh, Japanese distributor. Mm -hmm. And um, when did you learn about all these other companies like Roland and so on? Oh, we already knew about them. I mean, you know, obviously everybody was selling instruments and you go to the trade show and you meet people from the other companies. But, you know, yeah, we, you already know what's going on. They were uh, Yamaha, Roland, Korg were all selling things in the 70s. Uh, but the companies were, I guess, fundamentally different. Whereas, like, I mean, if you look at the lineage of where Yamaha came from as a company compared to Roland, for example, mm. could you explain that a little bit? Well, yeah, that, that, there's a big difference. Uh, uh, Yamaha is, you know, a hundred year old company, whatever. So they've been through everything. They've built pianos, they build motorcycles, they build, make sailboats and bathrooms. You know, they do all kinds of stuff. So it's the classic big company. Uh, you know, when they did the DX7, you know, they thought they'd sell maybe 10,000 of them and they sold 250,000. Uh, they never quite understood what they direction they were going, you know, and what they wanted to do. Uh, Roland was completely different. Uh, Roland was found by uh, Kakahashi-san, and he, uh, you know, was an engineer, and he is a very sharp guy, and, you know, the first uh, X amount of years of Roland was completely driven by him. So it was more of a product-driven uh, company, you know, with kind of a central person uh, with the vision. And that's the difference. You don't get that in a huge company because, you know, it's all top down. Um, so that, that there's a big difference just between those two companies. Um, you, what's kind of fascinating and probably motivating as well um, when you look at a lot of those histories is that a lot of you guys had more than one company in your lifetime. And... You know, in the same way as if you read, let's say, a Quincy Jones biography who went bankrupt, like, what, three times? Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, look at him now. And um, what do you, f um, maybe that's a rather German way of approaching it, but, I mean, Germany, if you ever fail, then you might as well commit suicide. It's done. It's, like, over. And um, you guys just go, like, oh, okay, let's start another one. Glad I'm not German. Well, <laughs> yeah, glad, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why you changed the name, I guess, or someone in that lineage. Yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, uh, I mean, Kakahashi-san had, had a different company beforehand as well, right? right. So well, it's yeah, he had. Uh, well, he was uh, Hammond Japan and mm. Ace Tone, and I, I, I don't know the structure of the exact mm. companies, but mm. yeah. But you guys are kind of good, right? I mean, yeah, just I just saw him last week. Yeah, yeah. I just visited him in Hamamatsu. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, he's still up to some tricks we hear. Uh, he's, yeah, he's not with Roland. He's kind of split with them and he's starting another company. <laughs> at age what? I, I don't know his exact age. He's got to be at least 80, I would think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there, there's a bit of entrepreneurial <laughs> and research spirit. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what were you talking about? Circuitry? A little bit of everything. I hadn't actually met with him. Uh, you know, as you probably know, we got the Grammys together, but he mm. wasn't able to come over mm. to L.A. for the ceremony, so mm. we didn't get a chance to meet then. So mm. that was actually one of the reasons I came over uh, was to stop by and visit mm. with him. Yeah. So it was kind of fun. It was right. uh, just kind of catching up on things. And I mean, you guys worked together on something that's also known as medieval. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and um, in the very early 80s, like what was that all about? Uh, how long of a story do you want here? I guess folks just settled in, so do it. In. Nighttime stories. Um, uh, well, it, it started in 1981, I guess. What happened is, you know, the Prophet 5 is the first musical instrument with a microprocessor in it. Uh, and Then soon other companies started making instruments with microprocessors. And once you have a microprocessor in an instrument, you realize how easy it is to communicate digitally to another instrument with a microprocessor. So we had accessories. We had a polyphonic sequencer. We had a remote keyboard and a number of things that had a special interface that we had developed uh, just for that purpose. It was actually a serial interface. It was 10 times faster than MIDI. Uh, Roland had something called the DCB bus. Uh, Oberheim had another bus. Yamaha, everybody had something different. So, of course, not products from different companies would not connect to each other. So some of us sort of figured out that that's kind of dumb, and if the industry was going to go someplace, we should fix that. Because uh, at that point, the industry was still pretty small uh, for synthesizers. Um, so I decided to get somewhat aggressive about it, and I delivered a paper at the AES convention in New York in October of 1981. What's AES? Uh, audio Engineering Society. It's a technical organization for audio engineers. So I presented a paper, and it was for something I called USI, Universal Synthesizer Interface. Uh, and it was basically a kind of a call to arms. I said, we need to do an interface. It could be this. We actually define, fully defined an interface and said, this is a starting point. It doesn't have to be this, but we should do something. I followed that up with a meeting in January in Anaheim at the NAM show, and I invited anybody who made keyboards of any kind to come to the, this meeting, and I think they all did, so it was very well attended. And it was the same thing. I said, here's this USI thing. It's not perfect. It doesn't have to be this, but who wants to get involved? And it became clear real quickly that most people didn't. Uh, some people wanted high-speed serial, I mean, high-speed parallel buses. Some people uh, just wanted to wait and see. Other people, it was a non-invented here syndrome where, you know, if it's not my idea, I don't want to do it. Um, not, invent not invented here syndrome? NIH. That's a standard engineering term. NIH means it's a bad idea because it's not my idea in, in so many words. So if it was not invented here... So um, I, got, I was a little discouraged after the meeting, but what happened is the uh, Roland people approached me the next day and said, well, some of us still want to do it. So we went to their booth and met with uh, uh, Roland, Korg, Yamaha, and Kauai, who were all willing to get together and do something. So we said, okay, let's start working on it, which we did. It's just kind of crazy. It's like all Japanese companies. And, and us, here. yeah. It was interesting at times, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, But yeah, that's basically how it started. So we started working on it throughout uh, 1982. And uh, I remember a meeting uh, as it was getting close to being done towards the end of the year, might have been around October or so, and Kakahashi came to visit us at Sequential. And uh, so we were kind of finalizing things <coughs> and going over the spec. And they had suggested changing the name instead of USI to Universal Musical Instrument Interface because it shouldn't be just be for synthesizers, which made sense. And then they thought it was kind of cool because you, you pronounce it you, me, which means you and me, are, our synthesizers connect and that sort of thing. And so we thought about it a little bit, and I didn't quite like that idea. So in the same meeting, I just kind of threw out, well, how about musical instrument digital interface? Everybody goes, hmm, okay. And that was it. 
that's where the name came from. And where did the military come in with the general MIDI? <laughs> that was much later, and I had nothing to do with that. Le leave me out of that one. All right. <laughs> Um, leave me out of that one is um, something that a lot of people actually experience once they try to use MIDI to um, make one machine talk to the other. And God forbid there's a third one entering. Um, is there a layman's term way of explaining of how to solve your MIDI problems really quickly? Uh, well, it depends what they are. Uh, you know, the basic idea of MIDI and basic interface is very simple. If you plug a, an out to an in and you play notes, it'll, it'll work. Uh, usually MIDI uh, problems come from trying to map controllers or synchronize clocks or that sort of thing. And then it's usually something as simple as making sure your settings are right so you're using the right clock and that sort of thing. But, you know, MIDI problems can mean a lot of different things to different people. In general, actually, that's a, the, one of the, MIDI survived for 30 years in version 1.0 because it's cheap to implement. It's fairly easy to implement for developers, which is important. It's fairly simple, uh, but it still covers about 95% of what people need to do. Uh, so... If other people had, had their way, and some of these people who are talking about MIDI 2.0 and so forth, it could be significantly more complicated to use because it, you know, they wanted to do everything, which would be nice, but uh, unnecessary for what most people want to do. So actually, it's it's a fairly simple system to use. So you can imagine what it would be if it was hard. <laughs> um, I guess so. But um, is there any sort of technique? Um, that helps you to determine where the actual problem lies or how to find them quicker? Is there a standard procedure, how to check things? Because uh, the standard thing is like A is not talking to B or talking right. too much so you keep hearing something without doing anything. Well, the basics as with anything audio is to make sure the cable is plugged in the right place. I mean, that works for audio as much as it does for MIDI and we've all done that. You know, everything's set up. It doesn't work. Oh, it's not plugged in. Uh, but I, I've been in, you know, big universities where they've got everything set up and, you know, it won't work for the lack of one MIDI cable that's not plugged in or one audio cable that's not plugged in. So, it, you know, that's that's the starting point, I suppose, <laughs> is to make sure it's actually go and going from out to in instead of the other way around. I mean, there's a million, th we can talk about this forever too. And I mean, it can still go on forever um, if you, even if you're extremely accomplished. I remember a situation where you, Mr. Lynn, Mr. Oberheim, and two rather seasoned producers were standing around, um, I think a Tempest and another module. And for an hour, we did not have any sound in um, Palm Springs. Palm Springs? Yeah. Uh, that took a while, and I think that was the Could be. that was the best relief to everyone in the room because it was like, okay, if these guys can't figure it out in time, then okay, I'm gonna just chill. <laughs> like, it was probably a missing cable. There, there is a good chance there was that, yeah. Um, but um, you can use MIDI for a number of reasons as well. Was that actually intended in the first place? Uh, most of it. I mean, we the clocks were in there. We. The original spec had pictures of computers <coughs> controlling things. So we, even though computers were pretty basic back then, we knew that was the future. Uh, so yeah, most of it, it's kind of doing the same thing it used to then. Uh, the biggest problem that people voters always complained about is that MIDI is too slow. Uh, and initially, the problem wasn't that, wasn't that MIDI was slow, it was that the instruments were too slow. Uh, all of us were guilty of this. Our, uh, you know, we put microprocessors in an instrument, and then we asked the microprocessor to do way too much stuff because we're trying to keep our costs down and use a cheaper microprocessor. Because back then they were very expensive. Uh, so then the microprocessor is too busy. So when a MIDI note comes in, it says, "Well," oh, and it takes it a long time to actually play it. So it wasn't the problem that it was slow over MIDI. It was the problem was the microprocessor couldn't do it quickly, play the note quickly enough. Uh, nowadays, the speed isn't an issue because it's almost always over USB, so there's you know no transmission speed problem. One of the interesting things about it 
if you want to look at it philosophically in a musical kind of sense, is that you were actually able and disconnect the various um, sound sources from the actual playing device. Mm. And that, I guess, opened the realm of possibilities. Was that intended and to which degree? Uh, I don't remember on that one because, uh, you know, something called local control that does that where it turns off the surface for the instrument and only works over MIDI. And I don't remember. That might have been in the first spec. Uh, I don't remember. That was 30 years ago, man. Come on. <laughs> it's like, yeah, sometimes it's hard enough to remember what was going on last night. And, yeah. yeah. So... Um, when did you start thinking about like, oh, hang on, this actually allows me to separate the unit and probably just sell parts of it as a rack mount version without the keyboard costs and stuff? Because I guess the, the keyboard as a controller is relatively complicated to um, develop with, if you depending on which amount of expression you want to give it. And like um, pianists would be extremely... <clears throat> manifest about having like hammer mechanics and whatever and um like if you want to have stuff like an aftertouch instead of a simple on off kind of thing and um so yeah i was wondering like did you start factoring that in and just go like hey we can uh yeah as far as the module versus the keyboard i think that uh came later uh back in the 80s people still liked having stacks of keyboards <coughs> on stage, even if they were connected by MIDI, it just looked good, to, or they thought it looked good to have them all piled up like that. Because uh, I don't remember, I don't think we did any MIDI modules at, at Sequential. It wasn't until later. Um, so everything pretty much still had a keyboard on it. Uh, the mechanics of the keyboard can get more complicated uh, mechanically. The electrical part's usually pretty simple. Uh, but like the Prophet 5, you know, there's no velocity, there's no aftertouch. It's, you know, as basic as it comes. But uh, ever since then, obviously, we have all of that on just about everything. When did you start introducing that into your products? Well, back, uh, actually, we had one instrument that where we kind of went way overboard, and that was the Prophet T8, uh, which actually had wood keys that were... <coughs> this long and it sensed the velocity from a flying hammer so you'd hit the key which would actually hit a hammer that would move and that we had little uh, optical sensors on it to uh, uh, sense the velocity and then it actually had polyphonic aftertouch which was pretty rare uh, and it had 76 notes um, 76 keys so that was we kind of took that to the extreme and uh, people still like the Prophet T. It's, it's, a lot of people still think it's the best keyboard they've ever felt. In fact, we started selling them to uh, Sin Clavier after a while because they wanted a good keyboard, and they, that was the only thing that they could find that would feel good enough to put in their $200,000 keyboards. Uh, but it was also a pain in the ass because these things were wood. It would take us six or seven hours on each unit to actually regulate the keyboard, almost like you have to regulate a piano keyboard because uh, it wasn't just plastic and metal. It was wood. So when you realize something like that and you're running an actual company, like, do you have sirens going off in the building? Or like, holy shit, we developed something that actually takes a lot more work than we can actually facilitate? Uh, you never like to find out things like that. But, you know, it's just part of the gig. You know, you just kind of deal with whatever comes up. You can't always predict everything. Um, what were your favorite products out of that era that you did you within your own house? Uh, well, Profit 5, I mean, you know, it's the first one, so you always like your first child. But uh, beyond that, uh, it's, uh, it's like picking your favorite child. You, you can't do it. You can't say, this is the best one, this is the best one, or... And they're musical instruments, you know, they all have their own flavor. It's like even now we have the uh, Prophet 08, but we also have a Prophet 12, and they're both polyphonic synthesizers, but they sound different. So some people like the sound of the Prophet 12 better, some people like the sound of the Prophet 08 better. It's, it's the same thing. I mean, guitar players pick whether they want to play a Strat or a Les Paul or a, you know, what, a Telecaster, they, you know, whichever one feels right to them, and that's what they go for. And we try to make uh, keyboards that give kind of that same 
connection to the musician, you know, the same personality and character, and you know, that's kind of our goal. How much do you actually talk to musicians to figure out what they want? Uh, we we talk we talk to uh, musicians a lot, but usually after the fact. Uh, so when we come out with a product, we we welcome feedback, but we we do not go out and ask for feedback as we're developing it because that would be uh, distracting. Uh, and well, you know, I've been doing this for 35, 40 years now, so I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do on a new instrument. And it, you know, that doesn't mean they all come out perfect. But one of the reasons we can develop products as fast as we can is because we don't ask for feedback. Another thing I've seen happen in some other companies is when you see a new product come out, you can tell it was designed by committee because it kind of loses focus and it looks like, well, somebody wanted this idea and pushed hard and got that in, but somebody else wanted this idea, but the two ideas don't really, you know, mix correctly. And again, when you're designing a musical instrument, I think it has to have a pretty clear focus and you, know, you just, it's tricky. I mean, it's not easy, but the fewer people involved, the easier it is to do. And um, does that hold the same for who you're aiming a product um, for? Because, I mean, there's obviously the classical, j classically trained musician, the jazz musician, more on the virtuoso tip. And then there is, like, the Brian Enos of this world. Mm. And um, you do it probably ag as much against the manual as possible. Um, <laughs> Yeah, some people swear they never read manuals, and some people say I erase every preset when I first get the instrument and start from scratch. I mean, it's you get a little bit of everything, but um, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. We we don't have anything in mind. We don't. We're not saying okay, this machine has to do dubstep really good, or we're nobody's going to buy it. I mean, we just don't target our instruments for a particular musical genre or style. We build what we think is going to be a good instrument. And then we just kind of let the market decide. And sometimes you come out with something and it's not fashionable at the time. And then five years later, it becomes very fashionable. And then 10 years later, it's not. And then 30 years later, it is. And uh, so you never know. When we came out with the Profit VS, uh, <coughs> you know, nobody wanted them initially. And then after we stopped building them about a year later, everybody wanted them. And they're still in high demand now. Uh, you know, the 808, 303, those classic examples. You know, when those came out, nobody wanted them. And, you know, they kind of were around for a while and then went away. And then, you know, of course, as we all know, you, you know, people would kill to get one now. And it's just they weren't fashionable. At, at the time, most of us were building drum machines. Uh, you know, once Roger Lynn invented the digital drum machine, you know, sample-based, that's what everybody wanted. You know, they sounded real. They had a great sound to it. So when the uh, Roland products came out, everybody kind of laughed at them. Said, you know, well, that doesn't sound anything like these things. You know, why would anybody want those? So nobody bought them. But then somebody realized later, oh, wait, it's got some personality to it. It's different, and it does this kind of music really well. And so it's, you, you just never, you don't always know. Um, you said fashionable. Um And you're turning out quite a lot of product pr around these days. And there's, it's almost like seasons, it feels like. Do you approach it like a fashion designer in a way? It's like, oh, we need to have something ready for this the year's model. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, not really. We, uh, I don't try to make huge jumps between instruments. So if you look at our line of synths, uh, you know, you can see a lot of common things that are used in all of them. But we try to... we. We try to innovate and and do new things on each one. Something that's nobody else is doing. Uh, we don't want to try to get caught in a rut of building the same thing over and over again because that's kind of silly. Uh, we're not trying to make a fashion statement. We're trying to make something that we think sounds really good that people might like, and uh, and just go for it. Um, how do you decide on when there's enough knobs on a box or not? <laughs> that is the hardest part in designing and it's funny because you know most of the people in my company are a lot younger and and you know they've been learning about all of this last couple of years and that's th the hardest thing to teach them is what to leave out and it's not it's not a perfect system but if you come up with any 
uh, feature idea and say, should this be in there? The answer is always yes. Of course, it's a great idea. It should be in there. But if you put all of those in there, then you have a product that nobody can figure out and nobody can use. You know, I've seen ads for soft sense where they've said, you know, it'll take you 50 years to learn everything in this product. And I'm going, oh, why would I want to spend 50 years learning how to use this product? I want to use it now and keep it simple. So there is an art to deciding which features should be there uh, to keep it powerful enough to do a lot of things, but simple enough to wrap your head around it quickly. But still, on the monophonic one, there you get about three times the number of knobs than on your favorite one. Well, that's 35 years later. Th th these days, you know, a lot of things you just kind of have to have. So there are, you know, some limitations there, but we still try to shoot for a knob per function uh, interface so that any feature has a knob or a switch that you can grab and you don't have to be diving through menus. Uh, that's, you know, menu diving is, you know, nothing anybody wants to deal with when they're um, trying to make music. And that, that's, that's why I stopped doing software synthesizers. It just, the whole thing just kind of seems silly after a while. I mean, you were heavily involved in software synthesis for a long time and probably people don't know your pioneer status on that field enough because obviously everyone always associates you with anything profit related but um can you tell us a little bit about your ventures into solely software based yeah i was a uh, president of a company called seer systems in the mid 90s and we kind of went through a three-step thing uh, first we built the uh, probably the world's first commercial software synthesizer uh, under contract for intel to intel uh, and they didn't do a whole lot with it. So we did a second generation uh, that was more advanced once the Pentiums came out and as computers got faster. And this one was actually pretty cool. It's mostly a general MIDI synth, but it had a little bit of extra bells and whistles. And we licensed that to Creative Labs, and they sold a few million of them with some of their sound cards. Uh, and then as computers got slightly faster, we developed something we called Reality, which was the first uh, professional software synthesizer, and this is about 1995, 96, maybe. And it was pretty cool. It had subtractive synthesis, it had FM, it had sampling, it had physical modeling, it had all this stuff in uh, one software package. And it was fairly interesting back then. Uh, I, I've learned over the years that sometimes it's just as bad being too early into a market as is to be too late to a market as a manufacturer. But we went to the first NAMM show with reality, and people would walk up and say, well, oh, what do you got here? Well, we've got a, a software synthesizer. Oh, so we'd play them a few notes and say, this is a new product. Well, what is it? Well, it's, a, it's a software synthesizer. Where is it? Uh, it's software running in a computer. What do you mean? Uh, you know, as the concept was just so completely foreign to people that it, you know, again, it took a couple years after that. I think probably when Native Instruments first came out with the Pro 5 that people finally started realizing what software synthesizers were. Did they have, ever offer you to, you know, be part of their game? No, I, I got nothing out of that. Uh, Stefan Schmidt did admit that he kind of got the idea when he saw what we were doing at Seer Systems, uh, but that happens a lot. So. But do you think that's kind of a cosmic kind of like balance? It's like you look at what Moke was doing, trying to do the same. They looked at what you were doing. Someone else does it, and like it's a give and take thing. Well, if I had called this a polymog, maybe that would be the same. But yeah. to to actually use the name, it's a, and to have you know if it had exactly the same knobs as a mini moog, that then maybe. But uh, I think uh, it's what, there's a wait. difference of building on something versus copying it. And were you ever considering a legal action there? No, I dislike dealing with legalities. I, I don't get patents. I don't deal. In fact, my new company, I made a pledge to myself 12 years ago, and I started to see how far I could get <coughs> without using a lawyer. And uh, I have yet to still use one. So, so far, so good. And that is in the United States of America. <laughs> Believe it or not. Yeah, that is pretty impressive. It's like, yeah. Um, at the same time, though, I mean, all these guys, it wasn't only them, it was people yeah. in all other places. They definitely had the youth on their side because, I mean, all of us were like, holy fuck. I mean, that's like half a year of rent's worth, a machine like that, where the other thing is knowing someone and having a CD writer. 
I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really good things about software since. I mean, you know, they're cheap or free, like you said. Uh, they're in the box. You know, you could, it's really nice to have everything in your laptop. Uh, most of them sound good. You know, it's, they don't sound as good, but they sound good. Uh, so, you know, there's no reason not to use them. Uh, in my case, I just had an epiphany one day where I was realizing that for some reason I was never playing with our reality product. So I started asking myself, well, why am I not playing it? I always play with my own instruments. And I realized it was because of, uh, well, type, 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 click, click, drag, drag, click, clack, drag, drag, and then finally play a few notes and back, back, type, click, click, drag. And it just didn't have the, didn't have the look and feel of a musical instrument. Uh, and I just... It, it seemed wrong. So I like to say I was the first person to make software synthesizers and I was the first person to stop making software synthesizers and decided to go back to hardware. And now you see this happening elsewhere. You see software companies like Arturia making analog synthesizers. Well, why are they making analog synth hardware synthesizers if, like they've been telling us, their stuff sounds just like analog? Well, if it sounds just like analog, you don't need to build one. Yeah, and I guess also it makes a lot of sense for um, pure capitalist reasons. Because, I mean, a physical box you can still need to sell with. I, I like to say hardware is the ultimate dongle. Can we get the picture here? Is the screen on? <laughs> I say play on player. That's, um, I'm really glad we got that picture, actually. It's... Um, Congratulations. Yeah. That I'm must be like 1976, 77. And where were you? That was in Sunnyvale. That was my first office. It was uh, <coughs> probably four meters by four meters. And I love how's there, how there's the Moog poster in the background. Yes. It's like, like, you know, being a fan of a rock band. <laughs> Had to have something on the walls. <laughs> Right. Um, let's quickly switch through those. What are we looking at here? Uh, that's an early Prophet 5 days, so probably 1979. Uh, that's in a slightly bigger factory. I think by then we probably had, uh, uh, I don't know, two or 3,000 square feet. <laughs> right. That's a little later. Uh, that was last year. That's just the uh, current lineup. Um, Go out and buy some, please. There's a drum machine down there where a lot of people are asking, when is the update coming for the firmware, including that man just leaving there? <laughs> well, we've had a few over the, t over the years, but yeah. uh, I think there's another one coming up uh, probably within a month. Right. Are you still involved in writing actual code and stuff like uh, that? Uh, well, not on that product. Uh, one of our other guys is doing that. I'm working on new products. We have... Uh, Something in the works, as we always do. All right. Secret? Anything you want to tell? No. <laughs> Sorry. Who are all those good-looking gentlemen? Oh, that's a good picture. Uh, that's 1995. That's myself, Bob Moog, and Kakahashi, and Tom Oberheim uh, at a NAMM show in uh, L.A. So what happened in L.A. that's not staying in L.A. now that you're <laughs> going to tell us? Well, actually, I was interesting. There were um, there was uh, this guy from uh, Rene from uh, Italy, and every year he would come over to Nam, and we would do something called Pasta by Rene, where we would go to somebody's house and maybe 15, 20 of us and have dinner. And, uh, you know, we just all put together, built, make some food and sit down and eat and drink. And that was at one of those uh, parties. So, you know, Roger would usually be there and just sometimes some artists would show up and just kind of an informal thing. Let me guess, he played the guitar? <laughs> no musical instruments. We just got done with Nam. If anybody's been, those of you, well, the one guy who had been at Nam, after about the first hour, your ears start to bleed. So it's, you know, when you leave Nam for the evening, the last thing you want to do is hear music. It cures you temporarily, fortunately. But. Um, what's your favorite Bob story that you like to tell people uh, after a half a bottle of tequila? I don't know if I have a favorite story. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that this is something I can kind of relate to. Is If you asked him why a Mini Moog sounds so good, he'd go, I don't know. 
it's funny how as designers we like for any of these instruments you say well we need some oscillators we need some filters you kind of put the parts together but you never really know how the package is going to sound when you're completely done i mean you have some ideas and you hope it's going to sound good but there's always this last magic part when you put the whole thing together uh and you can't always explain why it sounds good or it's it's hard you know why does a guitar string sound good you know it's so it's uh it's an interesting way to look at the uh design of a musical instrument as far as design goes um people like roger or kakahashi san mainly came from rhythmical instruments you came more from the sound timbre kind of fabric um do you find that that results in a different way of engineering a machine well it's funny a couple things first of all my first product was a sequencer not a synthesizer. So I actually did start with a rhythmical instrument. Uh, and Roger is actually a guitar player, and he just kind of built a drum machine because, uh, you know, stories about uh, unreliable drummers. Uh, he had no idea, uh, and he was very confused when people started actually recording with the thing. And all those records that came out in the 80s that were Lindrum-based... Uh, <coughs> kind of took him by surprise. He didn't think people would actually use it that way. You know, to take this mechanical sound and make it into music was, you know, not the intended purpose. I still love how he says rap or hip hop as if there was giant <laughs> quotation marks around the words. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, to think of him as the uh, father of hip hop through the MPCs is kind of hilarious, knowing Roger. <laughs> Wow, there's a lot of people on here now. Uh, it's not up there. Oh, is it not? Oh, there, there we go. go. Yeah. Uh, this is actually kind of a cool picture. It was taken at Stanford University, and it might be <coughs> the best single photo with a lot of cool people on it. Starting from the left is uh, John Chowning, who basically invented FM at Stanford University, so he's could be called the father of the DX7 and so forth. Did Yamaha uh, buy him a house? Uh, I think he was probably taken care of pretty well. Stanford University certainly made a lot of money on licensing the technology. Even though if you ask John, he'll say that, you know, Yamaha did all the hard work and, you know, it wouldn't have become an instrument without all their hard work and he just kind of came up with the idea, but that's just him being modest. So did you ever ask him whether there was any chance of making it easier? Because... Uh I mean, it uh, takes about three people to program a DX7, right? Well, he, he was kind of out of that loop. You know, again, Yamaha was the instrument designer. And like I mentioned earlier, Yamaha had no idea that it was going to take off. But, you know, it was just the right combination. It was $2,000, which was a lot cheaper than most instruments then. It, was, um, it had velocity on it, which was new. It was 16 voices, which was big, because all the analog instruments were still six or eight voices. Uh, and... Most of all, it sounded like a Fender Rhodes, and that's why people bought them, because they weighed a whole lot less than a Fender Rhodes. That back then, people were still taking Rhodes with them on tours, and they weigh you know, a couple hundred pounds. So, um, And it had MIDI on it. It was one of the earlier MIDI instruments. And it 90. was a lot lighter than a CS80. Yes, and a lot lighter than a CS80. <laughs> uh, also in there, you go over three or four. You know, it's, well, you can see me. To the left of me is Roger Lynn. To the right of me is Don Buchla. And then next uh, two over from him is uh, Tom Oberheim. Uh, the older gentleman in the middle is actually Leon Theremin. Uh, next to him is Max Matthews, who's the uh, father of computer music. He was doing computer music uh, at Bell Labs in the 50s. Uh, so it's just uh, it's a great combination of uh, uh, very influential people in the uh, world of synthesis. Who are the height? Who are those two? Uh, that's I think Paul Lasky, uh, uh, composer. That's David Wessel, who runs. He was at EarCam for a long time, and now he runs uh, Simnat, which is the kind of electronic music uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. I don't know who that is. Uh, Good so, suit, though. Yeah, I don't know who everybody. I, I forget who those people are. Also. <laughs> I think that's what what they tell you in in middle school. Like write the names of, on the picture because in five years you won't remember. Oh wow! Oh, so this is a picture from uh, three or four days ago, actually, when I stopped to vis visit uh, Kakahashi. 
And again, this is the first time we got together since our awards last year. So it was uh, very fun to visit with him for the afternoon. And that's the, uh, what I called the Model 600. That was my first uh, product ever, <coughs> 1973, maybe 74. A rhythmical instrument. A rhythmical oh, wow. instrument, yeah. That, uh, it kind of works like you imagine it might, looking at that and knowing how sequencers work. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I built it, I figured other people might want to buy them. So I started a company called Sequential Circuits, and I think I sold four. <laughs> so it was, it was a booming business. Were you thinking of throwing yourself off the bridge then? Oh, I didn't care. I was just amazed I could sell anything. <laughs> so that's the uh, spec sheet from for the Model 600. Uh, okay, this is the uh, the amazing first MIDI connection ever. It was at the 1983 NAMM show. It looks like a Jupiter. I'm actually I'm actually playing a Jupiter Six uh, at the time, and there's a couple rolling people there. Um, and somebody wearing a very cool satin sequential circuits jacket. And do you still have any of those lying around somewhere? Yes, we do. Denise and I both have one uh, at home, and someday I'm actually going to wear it in public again. Oh. <laughs> do you do them in XL? <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody always wants it. When they see something like that, everybody says, oh, we got to remake those. But you never know. I mean, someday we, uh, we'll take three orders. You still hold the name uh, rights? Uh, yes. Actually, we just recently got them back. Uh, were you ever tempted to do sequential two or? You know, we talk about it and someday maybe we'll do something, but uh, no particular plans. Or well, here, let's, let's take a vote. Should I change the name of the company from Dave Smith Instruments to sequential circuits? <laughs> Somebody say yes, just, to, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Just for the jacket? Yeah, just use them all. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, you could do that. That's, that would we be we like could do that. anything we want. That's the best part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just do like, you know. We'll start a side business. Yeah. Do you like the prime, very limited line? Exactly, yeah. What's with all the proc rock typo? Like the profit and, uh, you know, the letterings that you use? That was just something that we came up with 35 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, back then to do uh, something like that, uh, does anybody know what letter set is? Yeah. That's where you get sheets of letters uh, in different fonts, and then <coughs> you rub them on to, uh, to paper. Mm -hmm. So that's how we used to do things like that. So that's where the Prophet 5 and even the sequential circuits were both letter set fonts that we, uh, I think, obviously, I think you can get the fonts now. Is it? Could be. Could be. They're, They're we all the use the same well. fonts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you, yeah, you could sell to Apple as well. Like, yeah, we could. Work for them. <laughs> oh. So there's a, the Prophet 600 and the Roland uh, Jupiter 6. Uh, the Prophet 600 was actually the first uh, MIDI instrument of any kind. We shipped that in December of 1982. And then, you know, a few months later, the Roland Jupiter 6 came out. So what happened? We were at the NAMM show, and they were showing the Jupiter 6, and we were showing the Prophet 600. So at one point... I mean, this is all very informal. That we <coughs> decided to bring it their product over to our booth, so we just kind of made room for it and stuck it in there, and we got a MIDI cable, connected the two, and uh, it actually worked. Uh, but there was no, you know, people ask, well, did you have all the press there, and was there a big thing? And we said, well, no, we just kind of did it. I mean, this whole thing was so informal. If, if we had done MIDI uh, the usual way, I, getting a standard made, takes years and years and years and you have committees and documents and da 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 and so we bypassed all of that by just basically doing it and then throwing it out there so it kind of was fitting that when we first connected the two instruments that there was pretty much virtually no fanfare involved at all um can we see the fanfare moment again oh yeah great 
that's the origin of medieval. An early f- Prophet 5 ad. Where did the Sphinx come in? <laughs> I don't know. That was out of the uh, brains. We had this guy who did really cool airbrushes, uh, John Mattis, who's actually still around. I just ran into him uh, a couple months ago in San Francisco. Um, so he, I don't know where he came up with the idea. We probably said we wanted the uh, legend in its own time, and that's what he came up with. Where did you find the wood? Where did I find the wood? Yeah. Or why, or both? Uh, well, I guess a lot of it was still the Minimoog influence. You know, original Minimoogs were done in wood. The first cup, uh, first thousand prophets were made from a wood called koa, and they were just the stunning, beautiful wood, but a limited supply. And so we had to stop using it after a while. And I think these are walnut, maybe? Uh, I forget um, what we switched to. But, you know, it was kind of the idea. Analog synthesizer, more organic. You know, it just wood kind of warms it up. Back then, a lot of people, you know, we'd hear of doctors and lawyers buying Prophet 5s just to have in their, you know, in their living rooms, just as furniture. It makes for a great heater as well. Yeah. And another early ad back in the uh, back in the days when we were just trying to explain people what a programmable synthesizer could do for you the fact that you could actually hit, hit a button and completely change your sound so you did really get a number of different instruments for one and this was from uh, today we were uh, we were wandering in the streets of Shibuya and walked into a music store and they have a Profit 5 in there that costs uh, over $5,000. So it's more than $1,000 more than what they cost when they were new. Uh, in the same store, they had a DX7, and it was about $200. So basically, there's no uh, market for uh, vintage digital gear, and there's a huge market for vintage analog. And if you asked me 35 years ago if I thought people were still using those, I would have laughed. I mean, you, the thought of designing something electronic that would be used for that long. I mean, think about it. Nobody has anything electronic that's more than, what, two or three years old. You might have something, a toaster that might be a little older. But you know, basically, you don't have old electronics. So keeping old electronics running like this is, is a non-trivial thing. It's, uh, it's just... The whole concept of uh, an electronic instrument that old is, I think, very strange. It's pretty resourceful, but it's cool. though. I mean, they sound good. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> For the Pro One? Wow. <laughs> that was a cool one. It was, it was, this was kind of funny. Every, I think I mentioned earlier, everybody else was starting to make uh, polyphonic programmable synths. Uh, so after two or three years, we just decided to just kind of for the hell of it, to build a non-programmable monophonic synth and kind of uh, turn it all upside down. And we tried to make it as inexpensive as we could, which is why it, it looks so funky with that weird plastic that we used. Uh, we probably tried a little too hard to make it cheap, but um, it sounds the way it sounds, and people like the way it sounds. And it's another one of those, not completely accidental, but, you know, it's just kind of cool how how well it took off. And since it was inexpensive, there were tons of people bought them. Uh, I know they're really big in the UK, uh, in, you know, in Europe in general, just because the cost was uh, made it available to people. And as we all know, a lot of cool music was made from them. So, And, and here's an example of the kind of thing that uh, was way too early and didn't catch on. This was in the early 80s. Uh, and it's basically a programmable modular effects device before anybody had programmable effects. And the idea was you could buy a distortion unit, a mixer, a delay, a phase shifter, whatever, and you plug it into the uh, one of these racks, and it became programmable. So you know you could set up all these uh, different effects and turn all the knobs and t- make a sound out of it, and press a button to remember the settings. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, it was fairly expensive, but uh, it never really caught on. So back then, when things wouldn't catch on, we just stopped doing it and moved on. And had we kept doing it, we probably would have been successful as they got cheaper and smaller. But 
Oh, well. You're still smiling, so yeah. it's not that bad. Uh, that's the Monster Prophet 10. Uh, the story there is when I first did the uh, Prophet 5, I actually had two versions, and you could buy either a Prophet 5 or a Prophet 10, and it was exactly the same case. Uh, the only difference is the Prophet 10 had twice as much electronics inside, so you could play twice as many voices. Uh, but it turned out to not be very re reliable, and it, uh, or even less reliable would probably be a better way of putting it. Uh, and uh, they just got too hot, and we just, after not selling too many of them, uh, we just had to discontinue it. So it, it always seemed like we had to come up with a proper Prophet 10, so we built this monstrosity with the two keyboards and a polyphonic sequencer in it. and It's, it's a fun box, but it's huge. Yeah, it's it's good fun, but just you need to rearrange your living room after that. Yeah, pretty much, and and hire two strong guys to carry it. Um, this is the Prophet Two Thousand, the rack version. Well, I guess we did have a rack version of something. There we go. Uh, this is a couple of years later, so this is our first sampler. Uh, the difference with samplers back then, the way we did it is the digital samples would actually play back through an analog filter, and it really gave it a different sound. Uh, because it kind of, eh, I hate using all the usual words, but it kind of softens it up or makes it more rich or whatever you want to say. But it definitely, using an analog filter on a digital sample really does affect the sound. And the original drum machines are all that way, the Lin drums, the drum tracks, and so forth. Um, and once they turned di completely digital, then it was always a slightly different sound. But um, Those buttons look oddly familiar. Yeah, they were... Uh, the same ones as here, but we also had a matrix uh, for programming it. Um, not necessarily the best interface, but this was kind of the problem is the same thing that happened with the DX7 is once you get to the point where you have too many parameters to control, then it gets really difficult to come up with a usable user interface. Uh, it's certainly much more of a challenge. How do you navigate that now? Because, I mean, the module version of that has about a tenth of the knobs. Uh, I th yeah, it would have been fun to have one to show because it's actually very quick because, you know, there's a main control. You just hit it. If you want to uh, program the oscillators, you hit the oscillator switch, and the displays on these are very clear and easy to read, and uh, very it's very fast. So even though it's technically a menu system, it's really hit one button, hit another button, and turn a knob. So everything is, is very quickly uh, accessible. With those displays, do you care in any sort of way um, where th those displays are in 10, 15 years? Obviously, you can't really foresee that. But, I mean, with those, you know, okay, those are going to be standard issue. And even if they're not working, you just use them to step through mm -hmm. a very simple set of parameters. Whereas there, you really need it. Like, um, yes. how do you foreplan that when you design it? Well, we do things like, you know, have it turn off when you're not using it and, you know, things like that. Because an OLED display will eventually gradually get slightly dimmer. Uh, it should be, well, <laughs> here, I, here I'm talking about 40-year-old instruments. So, you know, I, I suppose we should have designed it to last 40 years. But uh, uh, they will probably have to be replaced in 25 years. I don't know. I won't be around, so I won't care. So Somebody else can deal with it. <laughs> 